so you can email me if you have any questions, which you probably will, because I'm going to go through this really fast. Um, I only have an hour and quite a bit of content. So, yeah, sorry in advance for going too fast. Um, those are the references I use. Um, I'm going to go over microbio first. I'll try and rush over that because a lot of it's road learning. Um, and then I'll try and spend a little bit more time on immunology, but it's still going to be pretty fast. Um, I put 30 practice questions at the end. You won't have time to go over them, but you can do them at home. I'll put the answers in there as well. Cool. So let's get straight into it. Um, host parasite relationship is called symbiosis. So that's just a species living in or on the body of another. And there's three categories that you would have heard of. So mutualism is when both benefit. Commensalism is when one benefits and the other's neutral. Parasitism is when one benefits at the other's expense. So without normal human flora, they're all mutualistic or commensals, um, and they're only parasitic in situations where we become immunocompromised, and we call them, in those scenarios, opportunistic pathogens. So our normal human flora is mostly bacteria. We get it when we're born, and it changes throughout our life. Um, we have it pretty much everywhere, so on our skin with the positive bacteria, upper respiratory tract, um, GIT, there's heaps, and we've got more as you sort of go through the intestines. And then we have it in our genitourinary tract as well. The only places we don't have bacteria are in the lower respiratory tract and the upper urinary tract. So there's these three domains. They put them in the slides every year. I don't really know what the point of it is, but may as well go over it. Um, prokaryotes are your bacteria and archaea, um, if that's how you say it. Eukaryotes are eukarya. Um, just be familiar with it, I guess. So I've put a table here of the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. The main ones to remember are just that prokaryotes are almost always unicellular. They don't have any nucleus or organelles. They reproduce asexually um, and they can survive in a large variety of environments, whereas eukaryotes have a more limited range. Um, we've got organelles and nucleus. We can be multi or unicellular and produce, reproduce asexually or sexually. And then Bacteria mainly come in those three shapes, whereas eukaryotes can come in any shape or size. Um, so the prokaryotic cell wall has unique compounds in it, such as peptidoglycans. That's the one that changes in gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. Um, lipopolysaccharides in gram-negative bacteria, and that can cause toxic shock. Um, you've got mycolic acid. That's in things like mycobacteria and tuberculosis. Um, and makes it resistant to penicillin. Um, and you've also got to coat acid, and there's just sort of some diagrams of them there, if that helps. Um, gram positive versus gram negative. So, gram negative bacteria is pink on a gram stain and has that thin peptidoglycan. So, i.e., it has less some negative peptidoglycan, is how I remember it. Um, it also has LPS on its outer membrane. Um, whereas, gram positive bacteria is purple on a gram stain has a really thick layer of peptidoglycan and that's what it makes that's what makes it dye purple in a gram stain. Um, so external features of bacteria, you can have flagella, which is the motility, um, and they can be single, multiple, one end, both ends or all over. Pili and fimbriae, they're they look pretty similar, but they're not for motility, they're for um, cell adherence. So they help it stick onto host surfaces and also inanimate objects. Um, and a sex pillus can transfer DNA. Um, and the capsule can aid in adherence of bacteria, and it can also help in evading the immune system by mimicking sort of um, our own molecules or just resisting phagocytosis. And bacteria replicate via binary fission. So it's a simple process. The genome just duplicates um, and splits apart, like easy as that, um, just worth knowing. So bacteria is a pathogen. Um, Definition-wise, so a pathogen causes disease, whereas our normal flora doesn't normally cause disease. Um, and how severe the disease it causes um, is affected by virulence factors. So these are adhesion molecules, so whether or not we can actually physically remove the bacteria by coughing. Um, Antiphagocytic features, for instance, the capsule. Um, and toxins, so how much damage they can actually cause to the host. 
And within your di disease process, um, bacteria must enter the body, colonize the host, evade host defenses, multiply, and actually cause damage to the host before it counts as disease. So there's a few steps in the process. Um, I've put a slide of important bacteria here. I won't read through them all now because it's probably not that valuable for me to just say it out loud, but go through it in your own time. Um, some of the more important ones are Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So you see that in burns, but also it's a bit of a buzzword for cystic fibrosis, cystic fibrosis patients that can affect their lungs. Um, Respiratory-wise, you've got your strep. So strep hygiene is strep throat and strep pneumonia is Pneumonia, um, that one's easy as long as, as well as Mycobacterium tuberculosis to remember because it's just in the name. Um, with fecal, or fecal oral, um, always remember that Clostridium difficile is a common cause of diarrhea in hospitalised patients if you're on antibiotics, um, whereas otherwise it might be caused by E. coli or Salmonella or Campylobacter jejuni. Um, UTIs are commonly caused by E. coli, and then you've got your venereal ones as well. So you can go over that in your own time. Um, viruses are not actually living um, or part of the three domains. So they're acellular, and they require a host cell to replicate. They contain genetic information that can interfere with normal cell function, and their structure consists of a lipid envelope, which they normally acquire from the host cell. Um, and then they have little projections called hemagglutinin and, and neuraminidase and a protein caspid which has the genetic material inside. So um, they're classified based on the type of nucleic acid, so they can be double-stranded or single-stranded RNA or DNA, um, but they never have both RNA or DNA. Um, their morphology, so the shape of the caspid, capsid, um, whether or not they have an envelope, so influenza is enveloped, for example, um, and their host range, so it could have a narrow range, like just humans, or a really broad range, like your influences, which can affect humans, pigs, birds, etc. Um, and also what disease they produce. Um, so they repli viral replication, they have to attach to a host cell, and normally this is done via a receptor. Um, when they enter the cell, they'll start replicating, and they use the host cell mechanisms to sort of make more virions and genetic material. Um, and then they're released from the cell. When um, the virions are released from the cell, they can either butt out, and that's how you get your envelopes. They sort of come out and bring the envelope with it, or they can just sort of lyse the cell. So the cell sort of just breaks open and all the little virions come out, um, which seems like a destructive method to but I guess if you're a virus, it doesn't matter. Um, okay, viral disease process. So there's entry, primary replication. Um, sometimes it stops here. So for things like herpes simplex virus, it'll stop at primary replication. They just stay in that area where they're infected. So if you've kissed someone with warts, it'll just stay on your lip. Um, you'll get an innate immune response and an incubation period. And then viruses that become systemic will go through a secondary replication. Um, for instance, HIV, and they can affect sort of all your cell types. Um, and then you'll have a host immune response, and the host is able to release and transmit the virus, and the virus can then either resolve or continue on and become a chronic infection, like you might see in hepatitis B or C. So influenza is an orthomix virus with eight segments of RNA. Um, it has the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase on it. Oh, I just think I said before, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase is on influenza. It's not on all viruses, but it is on influenza viruses. Um, so there's three types of influenza. Influenza A is the one that's responsible for the regular outbreaks, and it's also the most important one. Influenza B does sort of sporadic outbreaks here and then, and influenza C, like, just don't even worry about it. Um, so influenza A has many different subtypes. Um, and then that's classified by different versions of H&N, so it'll be like the H1N1, H2N3, et cetera. Um, it's got a wide host range, and they can undergo antigenic shift and anti antigenic drift. Um, influenza B can also, go un uh, can also undergo antigenic drift, but not shift. So shift is just for influenza A. So antigenic drift is when there's a single point mutation in H or N, um, more commonly H. Um, because the virus is only slightly different, people might have some effective immunity towards it. So it's just a heavier than normal flu season and it isn't too bad. 
Whereas with antigenic shift, that results from two viruses actually combining in one host cell and creating a completely new virus that no one's ever seen before. Um, so there's no effective immunity among the community. And um, that's what results in pandemics. So things like um, bird flu, swine flu, Spanish influenza, and there's normally a high morbidity and mortality associated with that. So here's some important viruses to remember. Um, buzzword one is varicella zoster becomes herpes zoster and causes shingles later on. Um, what else? Rotavirus is the sort of daycare um, gastro type virus um, that you get in kids. Um, what else? Yeah, just read through these in your own time. Um, the oncogenic infections can be pretty important. So your HPV that can lead to cervical cancer and your Epstein-Barr virus, which can lead mm -hmm. to Burkitt's lymphoma. Um, and remember that Epstein-Barr virus can also be latent and cause glandular fever. Cool. So parasites. Um, <clears throat> parasitic disease is more common in developing countries and it can be caused by helminths, so they're your worms and they're multicellular eukaryotes. Um, protozoans, which are unicellular eukaryotes. Um, most protozoans don't infect humans, um, but the ones that do are pretty important, so we'll go over them later. Um, can I? Oh, I won't touch that again. That's not really funny. Um, okay, so then you've got, that's supposed to say ectoparasites. So they don't cause disease, but they can transmit them. So that's your things like lice, flies, um, ticks that will bite you and maybe transmit another parasite into you. So with your helminths, there's three different types. You've got your nematodes, which are your round worms, and they're the most common. Um, you've also got platy helminths, which are your flat worms, and trematodes, which are flukes. And I don't even know what a fluke is, so it probably isn't that important. Um, characteristics, they can be centimetres and metres long. They live in body cavities. They can attack any organ, and they can be transmitted either directly, so they'll reproduce in the host, and then you'll transmit them through someone else, or it can be indirect. So like these ectoparasites we were talking about, you might be bitten by an insect that transmits it to you, and then that <laughs> insect transmits it to someone else as well. Um, protozoans can be transmitted by insects, um, ingesting infective stages. So toxoplasma, toxoplasma you can get from eating um, contaminated meats. Um, ingestion of parasites or eggs, so giardia, um, contaminated water and venereal, so sexually transmitted. Um, here's some important ones. I just remember a second year told me last year that Giardia is the cutest um, parasite he's ever seen, and like I can't get it out of my head now, so I just thought I'd pass that on. Um, oh, it's so cute. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so parasites to remember. I know you're, um, the ones that they do test us on were these ones here, so you've got Trypanosomiasis, Brucey and Cruzy. Um, the way that I was taught to remember it is that cruise, um, if you're going on a cruise, you'd rather go on a cruise in South America than Africa. So it's not the African sleeping sickness, which is a little bit indirect, but like if it works, it works. Um, and yeah, you can read through this in your own time again. I don't have time to go through all of it. Um, buzzword, Giardia is greasy, offensive stools and diarrhea. Um, um, malaria, so there's four different plasmodium species that can cause malaria. Um, Felsiparum is the most dangerous. I, I think the other ones are like Plasmodium ovale, malaria, and there's another one. I should, probably should have put them in there, but I didn't. Um, toxoplasmosis, um, so that's the one that's reproduced in cats. In normal people, it's just flu-like symptoms that resolve, but it's really serious in pregnant people or immunocompromised people. So if you've seen train spotting, like the guy who had HIV got it and like ended up getting like a brain lesion and dying. So yeah, bad if you've got HIV. Um, okay, fungi. I've heard this lecture was just the worst, so I'm only going to do like three slides on it. But um, so characteristics of fungi: they're eukaryotes and they need oxygen to survive. Um, only a few types of fungi actually infect humans, um, and they can reproduce asexually or sexually. Um, in their cell wall, they've got a jostarol, which performs similar functions to cholesterol in our cells. Um, types, you've got yeast, which grows by budding off daughter cells, and mold, which grow by extending their hyphae um, and spores. And then you can have dimorphic ones, which are sort of a mixture of both, depending on the environment. 
Um, fungal disease. So there's three main types. You can have fungal allergies, and that's normally caused by just inhaling spores. That can be anything as severe um, as anaphylaxis to just like a mild sinusitis. So it really varies from person to person. Um, you can have fungal infections. So that's with things like um, athlete's foot um, and tinea and stuff. Um, so that can be cutaneous, which is on the skin surface. That's super common and fairly easy to treat. You just put cream on it. Whereas subcutaneous is when it's under the skin and in the tissue. Um, it's more serious but less common and it may need surgery to treat. Um, fungal toxicosis is the real bad one. So that's when you get mycotoxins that come from not storing food properly um, and that causes poisoning. So there's a whole range of super bad um, symptoms that you can get. Um, and then the severity depends on the type of fungi, um, how much and how long you're exposed to it for and also like your own personal factors like your age and health. Um, and then I've just put a little um, example there. I don't actually know how to say that, but it's a toxic black mold that grows on water damaged walls and it can cause like seizures um, and dermatitis and fever in people that come into contact with it. Um, here's some important fungi. Um, so cutaneous ones, those are your tinea. So tinea pedis, tinea cruris, um, tinea caporis. Um, tinea caporis causes ringworm. And I think, I can't remember if it was in, a, in an exam or a practice exam, but they do tricky questions where they'll be like, what parasitic infection causes these symptoms? And they put ringworm there, which isn't actually a parasite, it's a fungus. So just watch out for that. Um, subcutaneous, the one they talk about was sporothrix. Sporothrix shenki, so that's the one that's spread by rose thorns. Um, so it commonly affects farmers and gardeners. And then you've got your opportunistic fungal infections. So those are the things that are normally part of our normal flora, so like candida albicans. But for instance, women on antibiotics might get a thrush infection because the other normal flora have been killed. Or um, if it enters the bloodstream, it can cause infective endocarditis, so it can be super serious. Um, and yeah, so and the bottom one there, so you can get a pneumonia, but it's caused by a fungus, and that's an AIDS-defining illness because you only get it if you're super immunocompromised, um, as well as cancer patients as well. Cool. So just some terminology. Um, with um, sources of infection, you can have community acquired, so that's from other people, food, water, soil, inanimate objects. Um, you can get zoonotic infections so from animals, um, arthropods, nosocomial and iatrogenic. So I didn't know the difference until I made this presentation, but there is actually a difference. So nosocomial is when you get it from the hospital environment, whereas iatrogenic is when you get it from a procedure, apparently. I think that's pretty much it. Um, so epidemics are when a level of disease is above normal for the population, so flu season. Um, Outbreak is a sudden or unexpected occurrence of disease within a limited segment of the population. So when we got those Ebola breakouts in Africa. Um, An endemic is a disease that's constantly present in the population. So cholera in a lot of third world countries. And a pandemic is a global epidemic. So that's your swine flus, Spanish influenza, etc. Um, and here's just, this is just some more um, sort of forms of transmission. Um, they're pretty much what we've already talked about. The only one that's a bit different is this um, vector vertebrate reservoir. So the mouse has got a disease from a bug and then the mouse gives it to the person. So it's just a, a more indirect way of getting a disease, I guess. Okay, so strategies for control. So we can control growth of microbes by preventing access to the human body, um, killing them, um, reducing their numbers, or just inhibiting their growth. And the factors that affect their growth are the temperature, moisture, osmotic pressure, pH, and oxygen and nutrient availability. And that's why they grow so well in things like um, dressings and soiled linen and stuff because it's all like warm and moist and has lots of nutrients. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> the way we control that in a healthcare setting is by cleaning. So cleaning happens prior to any sterilization or disinfection, and that's to get rid of like tissue and blood. Um, so that's just washing it in hot water and detergent. Disinfection is removing or killing most viable organisms, um, so boiling water or antiseptics. And sterilization is removing or killing all viable organisms, so that includes spores and other reproductive stages. So with disinfection, um, some of the rules, um, and they did ask us about this on the exam, by the way, just so you know, because it does Can I? Where's this? 
Can I click this or will it break for me? Oh, okay. Perfect. Okay. So, um, what, where was I? Okay. So, the solution must be at the correct concentration and every part of the article that needs to be disinfected has to be in contact with the solution and for a long enough amount of time. Um, we can also use ultraviolet radiation, which kills bacteria by damaging DNA, but it can't penetrate like into things. So it's good for surfaces and like flat instruments, but not really for everything. Um, and then you've also got your chemicals. So phenolics for surfaces, iodine, so that's like surgical scrub, chlorine we use for de decontaminating blood spills, um, and chlorhexidine is for skin and hand washing. And then alcohol we use for sort of a patient's skin decontaminating before we inject or do a procedure. So sterilization methods using heat. So we've got dry heat sterilization. Um, this inactivates cell components by oxidation. Um, it melts plastic, so it's not so good for um, like catheters and stuff, um, but you can use it for incinerating infectious waste. So the numbers they give you is a hot air oven at 170 degrees for one hour or 160 degrees for two hours. Um, moist heat is more efficient and effective than dry heat, um, and it inactivates proteins, but it generally can't kill spores unless it's greater than 100 degrees. So it's used a bit more for disinfection because it can't really kill everything. Um, but if you use moist heat with pressure, it kills everything um, by denaturation de de of proteins. Um, I don't know why I struggled so much with that word. Um, and then you've got an autoclave to do this. So that's 134 degrees for three and a half minutes or 121 degrees for 15 minutes. Um, remember though, I think that might have be been a question if I'm allowed to say that. Um, and yeah, so you can see that moist heat is way more efficient um, because you're doing like three and a half minutes instead of an hour. Um, we also use ionizing radiation for sterilization. So um, it produces free radicals and bacteria which breaks down their DNA and they use this for heat sensitive materials and some foods as well. So that's where you do your gloves and catheters that would be melted by the, um, the heat sterilization. Um, okay, so there's also filtration chemicals. So filtration is when you remove microbes from sensitive liquids or gases um, and you drive it through um, some small pores with a vacuum pump. Like it's not a sieve, they're like really small pores. I thought it was just a sieve. I was like, how would that ever work? But um, no, you're, it's a proper thing. Like you have to use a vacuum pump and everything. Um, and so there's chemical sterilization as well. So they use chemical gases for that, like ethylene oxide, hydrogen peroxide, chlorine dioxide, and ozone. Um, nosocomial infections are hospital acquired um, and they occur when there is a breakdown in sterilization or disinfection procedures. Um, so Patients can self-infect themselves, so they might give themselves an infection from bacteria they had somewhere else on their body where it's supposed to be. Um, or you can cross-infect, so get it from another patient, your family or staff. Um, and there's environmental infections as well, so that's from food, air and equipment. Um, some common infections are Staph aureus, E. coli, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, um, so that's in burn patients, and Clostridium difficile at the end, which is the one I said often results in diarrhea in hospitalised patients because they're on antibiotics. Um, and then there's just a little pie chart here of the common types of infections. So urinary tract infections are really common because of catheters. Um, and then obviously surgical wound um, would always get infected. That just makes sense. And yeah, and then the rest makes sense as well, I guess, too. Okay. Um, I'm just going to skate over this because we'll go over it more in immunology. But um, your first line defences um, you have anatomical, mechanical, and chemical barriers. So your anatomical ones are your skin and your mucous membranes, um, and they just sort of physically keep microbes out. Um, mechanical ba barriers are things like coughing and sneezing. Um, antimicrobial chemical ba barriers are the lactic acid, lactic acid on your skin, which is actually produced by gram-positive bacteria on your skin, which is nice. Like That's mutualism at its finest. And low pH in the stomach from your gastric acid and lysozymes in your tears, sweat, and saliva can break down bacteria as well. And then your second line defenses are the ones that I'll go into later. So that's all of the sort of stuff that happens um, in the immune response. So we'll go over that later, like now. <laughs> okay, so the immune system. The immune system is made up of two separate systems that sort of work together um, to do a 
choreographed immune response. Um, so you've got your innate immunity, which is your initial defense against antigens. Um, so this is the one that detects antigens and then goes and initi initiates the adaptive immune system. It has no lasting memory and it's immediate onset. So that's what's happening in the first hours after infection. Um, adaptive immunity has specific immune responses to eliminate specific pathogens. Um, it also has memory, so it will remember pathogens that it's sort of faced before and have a fast and vigorous response to those. Um, and the onset of response can be hours to days after the time of initial infection. So cells of the immune system, um, you've got your myeloid cells, and those are pretty much your innate immune cells, your neutrophils, macrophages, basophils, eosinophils, mast cells. Um, your lymphoid cells are pretty much just your adaptive immune cells, so your T cells, B cells, and innate lymphoid cells, um, but also natural killer cells. So natural killer cells are the only innate immune cell that are lymphoid, if that makes sense. And then dendritic cells can come from both. Um, so how lymphocytes develop? Um, they both originate in the bone marrow, um, but the B cells will mature in the bone marrow, whereas the T cells will mature in the thymus. So you can just remember that by the letters. It's very convenient. Um, um, they both undergo a screening process to kill off defective cells. And once they're matured, they'll circulate into blood or lymph until they reach peripheral lymphoid tissue, so a lymph node, and then they can just stay there until they're called upon um, by angiopathy cells. So this is just a bit of an example of how they're selected for. So a B and T cell will be negatively selected for if it fails to... So at this stage, if it fails to express the pre-antigen receptor, it just dies. Um, and then they develop all their receptors. And if it doesn't recept if it doesn't have the receptor, it dies again. And then once it gets to this point, they test it with antigens. And the ones that um, recognize antigens weakly, they go on, whereas the ones that recognize the antigens super strongly are apoptosed. And that's because if you've got a super strong immune response, um, it can lead to autoimmunity. And that's how you get autoimmune disorders, because they'll just react to like anything and start killing off self cells, which isn't great. Um, specifically for T cells, so you can see here, um, if they don't recognize this MHC, they die. And if they've got a strong recognition, they die. So we're really looking for things that just weakly recognize it, if that makes sense. Um, you can look into that in a bit more detail, but that's pretty much the gist of it. OK, so immune cells. Macrophages um, are actually called monocytes when they're circulating in the bloodstream. I didn't know that until I did this presentation, so fun fact. Um, when they've migrated into tissue, that's when they become a macrophage. And they can be fixed stationary residents in some connective tissues. So you have LVL and macrophages, for instance. Um, they just sort of wander between cells and they aggregate at signs of infection. I don't know if in the, the heme one you did how they sort of stick to the thing and they roll along, yeah. Um, function, they signal the immune systems about they signal the immune system about pathogens um, and they produce cytokines. So the main ones that macrophages produce are TNFs, so that's tumor necrosis factor, and interleukin-1. Um, they also induce inflammation and signal local endothelial cells to increase the expression of adhesion mole molecules for binding of neutrophils and monocytes, and they cause vessels to become leaky um, so to increase the gap between cells and allow fluid and other cells through. So that's sort of what I was just talking about. So when there's a site of infection, the cells become sticky. So these macrophages that are just wandering around, just they don't know it's there because they don't have a conscience. They just literally stick to the vessels and can't get away, so they just do their job, if that makes sense. Okay, neutrophils are the most abundant white blood cell in the blood, and they're not normally found in tissues. They're characterized by their lobulated nuclei. So if you see this sort of thing in like a histo question, you know it's a neutrophil. Um, and production of neutrophils increases with infection. So it can actually go up to five times the normal amount. Um, they act really rapidly and then they just die. So pus found in infections is actually dead neutrophils, which is, it's, it was sort of confronting. Do you find that confronting? Like, I don't know. I think I'm just like projecting a little bit. But <laughs> so their function, they phagocytose pathogens upon encounter by using nitosis, which is neutrophil extracellular traps, 
which I think is super cool. They just sort of throw out this net of DNA and histones and just catch the pathogen and just kill it. So, yeah, that's how they work. Um, dendritic cells are called dendritic cells because they look like the cell body of a neuron, um, and they're your main antigen-presenting cells. So their job is basically to take up a pathogen in the periphery, um, then present it on the MHC class 2 receptors, and they'll come into the lymph node, present it to your T cells, and that's what initiates the adaptive immune response. So lymphoid organs and tissues, um, your lymphatics obviously have a lot of um, sort of jobs within the human body, but they're the ones that relate to the immune system. Um, when they drain the tissues of lymph, they sort of detect antigens that are coming from those tissues. So when the lymph comes back through lymph nodes, it's like a surveillance centre for infection. Um, and your spleen detects antigens that are in the blood. So lymph nodes do lymph, the spleen does blood, if that makes sense. Um, so an antigen on an antigen-presenting cell enters the lymph node through these afferent <coughs> lymphatic vessels, um, and the T and B cells enter through the arteries, through the high endothelial venules. Um, I think that's just a buzzword. Um, and then after they are activated by the antigen-presenting cell, then they'll leave through an efferent lymphatic vessel and go off and do their the immune business. Um, so the journey of a T cell, I didn't know what to call the slide, it's a bit dramatic, but that's okay. Um, so it starts off as either a memory T cell, so left behind from a previous infection, or just a naive T cell. They head into the lymph node, they get activated by an AP, an antigen presenting cell, and then they go into the blood vessels to peripheral blood vessels to the site of infection. Cool, so this is the stuff that I said I would talk about later and I've come to talk about it now. Um, so complement. So I think you didn't go into this in that much detail. I put the mechanism here if you want to learn it. I didn't learn it. I know some people probably did, but I didn't. Um, just the main sort of takeaway messages about complement. It's always present in the serum and it's just a cascade of molecules that sort of bind and cleave into smaller subfragments. Um, this, they say there's three pathways, but to me it just feels like there's one pathway, but there's three ways it can start and three ways it can end, and they're sort of unrelated, but um, which just makes it really confusing. But they're called the classical alternative and leptin pathways. And then the way it ends, they'll either recruit immune cells, so activate um, an adaptive immune response. They could increase phagocytosis, so they'll opsonize the pathogen to make it um, easier to recognize by a phagocyte or they'll kill the, um, the pathogen by creating a membrane attack complex. So that's the one, like, I don't know if you guys did see the video, but there was a video they showed us where all of these things come in and make this sort of ring, punch a hole in the pathogen, and then it just dies. So this is the exact mechanism. Um, you can, yeah, remember it if you want, but I'm not gonna go through it. And yeah, those are the diagrams. They just look so confusing. I don't even know what any of that means. Um, okay. PAMPs and pattern recognition receptors. So PAMPs are your pathogen-associated molecular patterns. Um, they're structures that are unique to pathogens, so they're easy to recognize by our innate immune system. And these include things like surface structures, for instance, LPS on gram-negative bacteria, um, or flagella, and also things like double-stranded RNA, um, sugar residues, unmethylated CPG nucleotides, because ours are methylated, so I'm just going to check the time. Oh, I'm going really fast. If I'm going too fast, like, just make a panicked face at me. Mm -hmm. I'll try and slow down. Um, so pattern recognition receptors are what detect pants. So there's three different types in our cells. Um, and then depending on which type they bind to, it will activate a different type of immune response. So our toll-like receptors are on the extracellular membrane. So those ones are more likely to recognize bacteria in the bloodstream but they can also be in the endosomal membrane, which is like that weird one that's like a circle inside the cell. Um, so it's like extra, and it's like on the outside, but inside, if that makes sense. And those are more likely to recognize viruses. So viruses that are inside the cell. I feel like that didn't make sense, sorry. Um, um, intracellular receptors, you've got your nod-like receptors. So they detect bacterial cell walls and rig-like receptors, which detect viral DNA and RNA. Um, so how this signal sort of happens, I'll just run through it. 
So this is toll-like receptor four. I didn't actually remember the different types of toll-like receptors, but I think we were suggested to. So you can do that if you like. Um, it detects the bacterial LPS and it gets triggered when it binds. Um, it then recruits these adapter proteins and those proteins will go, go on to sort of um, start transcription of cytokines and other signaling molecules. And then depending on what cytokines are produced, that can cause three different pathways. So a cytokine can be produced that will cause acute inflammation or it might try and signal for switching on adaptive immunity. Or if it has um, sort of sensed the virus, it'll switch on an antiviral state. So those are three different immune responses. And that's, um, that's these things here. So it depends on what cytokines are expressed. Cool. So inflammation. The aim of inflammation is to eliminate a pathogenic insult, um, remove all sort of injured tissue and components and just get everything back to normal. Um, you've got your five cardinal signs, which are heat, redness, pain, swelling, and loss of function. I put in the um, Latin ones too. I'm pretty sure in an exam they'll just use the sort of English version, but apparently some consultants like to use the Latin names, and they'll be like, what are the five Latin signs of information? So I just thought for your, for your information, I'd include it. Um, so a pathogen, is introduced to the skin. Um, and then you can see these histamines or other cytokines are produced by the injured tissue. And that starts to attract your macrophages. And also it signals to the endothelial lining of the blood vessels um, and they become leaky. So that's when your um, sort of phagocytic cells are coming through um, and then they'll eat up everything. And then you've also got your clotting agents, which one you would have talked about before. So, yeah, that's how it works. Um, okay, so activation of the inflammasome. I didn't understand this until I was doing this presentation. Like, I just thought it looked so complicated, but it's actually not as complicated as it looks. I mean, you probably all know that. Like, I was a bit slow last year, but anyway. So, basically, the whole point of the inflammasome is it's two separate pathways um, that just activate at the end one signaling molecule. And the reason we have two pathways is so that it's not activated accidentally or unnecessarily and it doesn't cause sort of unnecessary inflammation. So the first pathway, you've got your NLRP3 sensor um, and that will sense sort of bacterial products or potassium efflux or reactive oxygen species. And what's, once that's activated, it will join in the cell with an adapter and the inactive form of phase <coughs> one. And that's what makes the inflammasome. So then simultaneously, um, a pattern recognition receptor would have, um, would have sensed a pair, and that activates the synthesis of the cytokine pro-IL-1 beta, so it's not active yet. Um, caspase 1 is cleaved off the inflammasome and becomes active. And then if you have the presence of the active caspase 1, and pro IL-1 beta, then they sort of work together to make just your normal IL-1 beta, which is um, secreted, and that's what goes on to cause acute inflammation. So basically, it's just a mechanism to make sure if there's something wrong with the NLRP3 sensor or there's something wrong with your pattern recognition receptors, you're not um, secreting IL beta um, for no reason, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm seeing no, that's good. Okay, so activation of macrophages. Macrophages can be activated a number of ways. So they can be macrophated by, macrophated? <laughs> activated by um, PAMPs being recognized by toll-like receptors. Um, they can also be activated by the complement sort of opsonizing a pathogen, so marking it for phagocytosis. Um, and they can be activated by cytokines produced by other cells like interferon gamma. Um, so apparently there's two types of macrophages. I didn't know this. But you're finding out there's a lot I didn't know before this presentation, but I know it now. That's what matters, I guess. <laughs> um, so there's two types. You've got your classically activated ones, M1, and they cause inflammation. Um, and then apparently there's these alternatively activated macrophages, which are M2, and they prevent inflammation. So, yeah, the more you know. Um, cool. So natural killer cells. 
these are, like I said before, they're the only innate immune cell that's a lymphocyte. Um, and they recognize infected and stressed cells. And then they either kill those cells or they'll um, secrete interferon gamma, which is the one I said before, activates yep. macrophages. Um, so if the cell is healthy, the natural killer sort of comes on up, it binds onto the MHC1 marker and goes, no, this is all normal, I'm just going to go. But if it's a virally infected or cancerous cell, when the natural killer cell comes up to bind, there'll be something wrong. So it's a there's a picture on the next page. But once it notices that something's wrong, it's like, I'm going to kill this cell. Um, so that's illustrated here. There's In this picture, there's an um, inhibitory receptor, which is um, expressed on normal healthy cells, which is what the natural killer cell binds onto. So this one is not killed, whereas this one that has a virus in it is not expressing that MHC1, MHC class 1 peptide, so it's killed, if that makes sense. And that's how a natural killer cell works. Okay, so... Interferons are an antiviral cytokine. Um, there's two type 1 interferons, so interferon alpha and interferon beta, and they're released by virally infected cells to act on other cells. Um, so the way I think about it is if a virus infects a cell, it's pretty much too late for that cell, but it can still help out like its neighbour. So while it's being infected, it'll send its little interferon to its friend and say, hey, like, just so you know you might be infected soon. And then um, that cell can start producing antiviral um, sort of enzymes and will be able to stop that viral replication, hopefully, when it comes in. So, um, um, yeah, so like I said, they um, can activate natural killer cells or other immune cells to kill these infected cells, um, but they can also bind to receptors on neighbouring uninfected cells to activate signalling pathways induced expression of various enzymes, and interfere with viral replication. Cool. So the adaptive immune system, I put a little exclamation mark because it's all exciting, um, it recognises and remembers specific antigens. So antigens are any substance that triggers an immune response, hopefully foreign, but it can be um, from your own body, and that's when you get autoimmune disorders. Um, an epitope is a part of an antigen that binds to a lymphocyte receptor. Um, an antigen-presenting cell is a cell that engulfs, engulfs pathogens and then displays them with MHC2 markers to activate lymphocytes. And um, an antibody, which is not to be confused with an antigen, is a protein produced by B cells, and it's just the secreted form of the B cell receptor. Um, and that, So that's part of the immune response or humoral immunity. So the way we detect um, self versus non-self cells, so on both B and T cells, there's antigen-specific receptors. So a B cell receptor is just an antibody that hasn't been secreted. Um, it can recognize the entire antigen um, and epitopes, so it can do both. Um, and it can also be secreted and flow around by itself. Um, T cell receptors only recognize epitopes on MHC markers and they can't be secreted. Um, so the MHC that I've been talking about, that's your major histocompatibility complexes. So MHC class 1, all cells have them. So if any cell is infected by cancer or a virus, it can present um, on its MHC class 1 receptor that it's not doing so well and attract a phagocyte. Um, and then they activate CD8. So T cytotoxic cells. Um, and then a memory tool for that one. I didn't use this, but it's actually pretty cool. Like 8 times 1 equals 8. So CD8 cells are class 1, whereas MHC, it's like 4 times 2 equals 8. So you can remember it that way if you like. Um, so MHC class 2, that only present, present on antigen presenting cells. So they present antigens from bacteria, and they're the ones that activate CD4, so T helper memory cells. Um, so pathways of the adaptive immune response. So your humoral response relates to your B cells and your antibodies. So that's this one here. Um, so you've got your extracellular microbes and your B lymphocyte, um, and then it can secrete an antibody which um, can block infections um, and eliminate extracellular microbes. Um, Cell-mediated response, so that refers to T cells. Um, there's two different types, the so T helper cells and T cytotoxic cells. So T helper cells, 
they don't actually kill the cells themselves, but they help phagocytes to kill the cell. Um, whereas T cytotoxic cells use perforin to kill infected cells. So this is just sort of um, a nice sort of visual of how the adaptive immune response happens. So from the time that the antigen is presented, these lymphocytes will mature, expand, and then differentiate into sort of more specific lymphocytes. Um, and then they can start eliminating antigens um, either by cell-mediated immunity, so the T cells, or humoral immunity, so your B cells. Um, and then at the end of an immune response, most of your, all the B and T cells that you've sort of created die off, but you get your surviving memory cells which hang around to tell the tale. Um, and if it ever happens again, they know what to do. Cool. So um, phases of the humoral response. So like I was just saying, so you get presented with a microbe um, which activates your B cell, although I think your B cells are activated more from helper T cells and other stimuli. Then they expand and clone themselves and they can differentiate. So when they differentiate, there's a few different things that can happen. They either become plasma cells, so their sole job is just to like keep pumping out antibodies. Um, they can become memory B cells, so they'll remember it the next time. Um, and then there's a few other things that can happen. So isotope switching just refers to it can be pumping out IgG and then all of a sudden it decides that it wants to pump out IgM instead. Um, I don't, that's, I don't think that's so important. And then affinity maturation as well. It just means that as the immune response goes on, the antibodies will become sort of the affinity towards the pathogen will get stronger and stronger as the immune response goes on and that cells mature and get more used to it. But um, I don't think these are more important. Just remember that um, B cells turn into plasma cells and secrete antibodies, but they can also become memory B cells the next time. Cool, so the structure of antibodies, they're Y-shaped. You've got two identical heavy chains, these ones down the middle, and two identical white chains. Um, there's identical antigen binding sites on both arms, and each chain has a constant region, variable region, and a complementarity determining region. Um, basically, it just means that there's lots of regions that can be altered so that they can be highly specific for different pathogens. Um, and then there's five different types of antibodies. So I put them in a table here. Um, IgA is in mucosal immunity, and that's a monomer or a dimer. Um, IgD isn't secreted as an antibody, so that stays on a naive B cell. Um, IgE is the one that plays a part in mast cell activation, so you see that in allergic responses, um, but it's also for defense against helmets and other parasites. Um, IgG is the one that has a really high affinity, so it binds super strongly to um, pathogens, so it's good for toxin neutralization. Um, and it's also involved in neonatal immunity, so that's the one that can cross over the placenta. And then IgM is the pentamer, so that's the one with all the arms, it looks real cool. Um, that's an opsonization, so that will mark pathogens for phagocytosis. Um, and it's also the initial response to injury, so it's sort of the first one on the scene. So if you're taking like, um, like a full blood count and you, their IgM is really high but their other things aren't really high, it probably means they've just got an infection, nothing else has happened yet. Um, okay, so functions of antibodies. There's basically three main functions. Um, so they can either neutralise pathogens, so they'll just sort of like bind on so that these pathogens can't go onto receptors and do anything, um, so they're just useless. Um, they can opsonize, so they'll coat the pathogen and make it more recognizable to a macrophage, or they can activate the complement. So it's similar to opsonization, except instead of activating a macrophage, it'll activate a complement protein, and then that complement will either go on to do, to kill the pathogen instantly using its membrane attack complex, or it could further opsonize the pathogen, and then it just gets eaten by a macrophage anyway. Cool, so I feel like I'm going real fast. Oh, we've got 10 minutes left. Okay, so with immunity, um, acquired immunity, you can acquire it naturally or artificially, and it can be active or passive. So natural active is like getting an infection. So you have a chance contact with a pathogen and then your body responds, so you have those memory cells, um, whereas artificial active is like a vaccine. So it's a purposeful contact, um, and then you get those memory cells. Um, passive natural is 
for instance, your mum giving you IgG through the placenta or IgA from breast milk. So you don't actually have any memory. You don't have to have an immune response. It's just there. Um, and then artificial passive things like antitoxins. So they're injected straight into the blood. And, um, and yes, yeah, so you have those IgGs there if you need them, um, which you normally do if you're getting injected with an antitoxin. Cool. Um, hypersensitivity reactions. I've just put this on one slide. Like, so you know, it's probably not that important. I mean, it might be, because I'm not the authority. But um, So you've got type 1 to type 4. Type 1 are your things like an allergic response. So that's your mast cells and your histamines causing inflammation. Whereas type 2 are when your antibodies react against self cells or antigens that are actually normal in the extracellular matrix. Um, type 3 is immune complex mediated. So this is when an antigen antibody complex gets sort of stuck permanently in the basement membrane of vessels. So it's just sitting there like constantly calling like leukocytes to come and like clean it up and it's stuck and it never goes away. So you're just continually activating this immune response and inflammation. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how that happens. I guess you can look more into it if you're interested. Um, and type four is when T cells incorrectly react, incorrectly react to self cells. Um, monoclonal antibodies are used in treatment of different diseases. So this is when you sort of identify and then immortalize a single B cell that secretes an antibody of interest. So um, they use this sort of idea to produce um, medicines to treat autoimmune disorders and also cancer therapy. So in autoimmune disorders, you can sort of create this antibody and you keep replicating it. It's going to go and fight those cells that are attacking your own cells, if that makes sense. Um, and in cancer therapy, you're sort of giving – because cancer patients are immunos – oh, cancer patients are immunosuppressed. <laughs> this is a spoiler. But um, so because cancer patients are immunosuppressed, you're giving them just a bit of help to try and sort of reactivate their immune system so that they can continue to fight cancer cells. And you might have heard of Herceptins. Her Herceptin, so that's the specific one for breast cancer. And, yeah, so that's the end. Um, does anyone have any questions for, like, the last five – yeah. Oh, you're going to cut for me? Oh, thank you. Okay, so um, if you have any questions at all, just send me like a Facebook message or email me. Um, and then I've put 30 questions. They start on the next slide. Um, so you can access them on the Google Drive too. And, yeah, that's pretty much it from me. So good luck with your exam, guys. I'm sure you'll do great. Um, first year's not a big deal, so just take it as it comes.
Or the chocolates for you guys, yeah. For those who answer questions, all right. Give you a bit of a sugar rush at the end of the day. Pharmacology, okay. So this is how the lecture is going to generally run. Right. This is how the lecture is generally going to run. We're going to go a bit through general pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics, and then we're going to go into the huge list of drugs that you'll have to remember. Okay. So questions come up. I'm going to piff this ball at you. You're going to catch it. I answer it right, you get some chocolate. That's how we're going to play this, okay? Because it's pharmacology, there are a lot of drugs, right? I do expect some of you to get bored, so I literally put the questions randomly throughout the whole thing. I don't even know where they are. I'll be surprised when I come across them as well, okay? So, let's start. Pharmacology, right? We've got three different phases. Pharmaceutical phase, which uh, is in regards to the route of administration. Pharmacokinetic phase. Right, what the body does to the drug, pharmacodynamic phase, and what the drug does to the body. Okay, so we're going to start with pharmacokinetics. Okay, so you've probably seen this a hundred times. Adne, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. I'm going to do each. <laughs> haven't come across this before? At all? <laughs> no. Okay, absorption. It's pretty intuitive with, with the words, right? Absorption, your body absorbs the drug. Tap, um, distribution, the way the drug moves throughout the body into different departments of the body, and we'll go into more in depth soon. Metabolism, what your liver does to the drug, right? <clears throat> so, and excretion, how you remove the drug, okay? So, absorption. Since you haven't done this, right? Who wants to give this a shot? What, is, what, what do you think, right? Generally, what do you think will have the most uh, impact on, yeah? Hey, awesome. So you have done it, right? Three recipes and stuff. Hey, do you get a chocolate? I'll give you a chocolate. What do you want? Catch. Get the ball back. I'm expecting more distance in the bottom. Yeah. Okay, it's A, but also, what's another option it could be? So most of my questions will have more than one answer. E? Yeah, because lipo, lipid solubility relates to permeability as well. Okay? The more lipid soluble it is, the more permeable it will be, okay? So, this is really important, right? Because when we talk about drugs, most of them are weak acids or bases, which means they can be in an unionized form and an ionized form, right? Unionized means lipophilic, right? Ionized means hydrophilic, okay? And so lipophilic means crosses a membrane, okay? This is really relevant because most of the drugs are weak acids or weak bases. Let's talk about PKA. Have you come across PKA before? Yeah, so pKa is the pH at which 50% are ionized and 50% are unionized. Okay, let's give it an example. Okay, aspirin is a weak acid, right? That means in water it wants to dissociate and give off its uh, proton, or the H, right? Aspirin has a pKa of 3.5, right? If you take aspirin orally, it goes in your stomach. Your stomach acid has a pH of around 2, correct? So that means in that stomach, there's a lot of H ions going around. Okay, and it's a lot harder for aspirin to release its um, hydrogen ion. Okay, so what we get is more of the aspirin, right, being unionized. Okay, it's about 100 to 1. That means it's readily absorbable because unionized means lipophilic and means it crosses a membrane. Okay, so each drug has its own pKa value. Okay, if it's a strong or oh, weak acid or strong acid and whatnot. Okay, therapeutic window. It's a window in which the, the range of plas uh, plasma concentration between the minimum effective concentration and the minimum toxic concentration, right? The therapeutic index is the amount of drug needed to produce an adverse response over the amount of drug needed to produce a desired response. So let's say the amount of drug needed to produce an adverse response was super, super high, right? That means that that fraction is going to, like, overall, it's going to be a bigger value. The therapeutic index will be higher. 
it means you have more room to work with because you can go ham on the concentration and it doesn't affect the patient adversely, right? Because it's quite a high concentration required to have an adverse effect. So the higher, the better, the same, right? Bioavailability, okay, it's a fraction of drug that will reach the systemic circulation. Of course, this is largely dependent on the route of administration. If you give it intravenously, right, it goes 100%, it goes all the way. Orally, it takes a bit longer, okay, but it lasts a bit longer as well. Because we're talking about how the concentration of the drug in the plasma affects its excretion rate. So with intravenous, right, it's 100% to begin with. So the excretion rate is super, super fast to begin with. Okay? It's proportional. Distribution, how the drug moves throughout the compartments of the body. Okay? So compartments like this, blood, plasma, extracellular fluid, fat, and intracellular fluid, and other, which is all the other juicy stuff like uh, the CSF and all that stuff. So drugs bind to plasma proteins. Okay? So let's say a lipophilic drug. Right? Goes into your plasma, doesn't do too well for itself. Okay? It needs to bind to a protein to travel around. And that protein tends to be albumin for a lot of drugs. Okay? Drugs bound to um, plasma proteins are inactive and unable to be secreted. Okay? This is an equilibrium reaction. Yeah? So different drugs bind to different uh, levels of uh, bind to different amounts of plasma protein. Warfarin. 97% of warfarin binds the plasma proteins when only 3% is free and able to do stuff and be secreted, excreted. So, so what that means is that there's a lot down to plasma drugs, uh, plasma proteins, okay? And so let's say I use a bit of water, my cells use it a bit, okay? That means, right, it goes maybe down to 2%, right? What this reaction does, because it's an equilibrium reaction, is that drug from the plasma proteins will unbind and come free again. So it's an equilibrium reaction. What this means is that drugs which bind more plasma proteins have a longer half-life. Why? Because there's a huge reservoir of drugs, right? Which can be released and become free drugs. Cool? This is an opportunity for interaction. Why? Because drugs, multiple drugs can bind to the same type of plasma protein. Okay? They can displace other drugs. And this results in a higher level of free drugs, active drugs, right, which can exceed the minimum toxic concentration. Does that make sense? Cool. Other factors that affect distribution. Okay, so how easy the, it is to pass a membrane, blood flow to the area. Essentially, let's just look at this picture. So let's say I inject uh, morphine into the, the plasma, okay? What happens there in the plasma is we'll bind to plasma proteins, okay? And the proportion of it will be free. Okay? Then that free proportion can move to the extracellular fluid. Now, this is an equilibrium um, kind of reaction, but movement, right? It goes both ways. Yeah? So, a portion of that free uh, drug will go into the extracellular fluid where it will bind to proteins um, in the, you know, collagen and whatnot and all this other stuff. And it gets stuck there, some of it's free, and that free proportion will go into the intracellular fluid and some of it will get stuck there, some of it won't. And same deal with the other. So you can see that it kind of disperses, and depending on what drug it is and what kind of affinity it has for certain proteins, it disperses differently. Okay? So this brings us to the volume of distribution. Have you heard of this before? Okay, so just like each individual drug gets its own PKA, each individual drug gets its own volume of distribution. Okay? It gives us the ratio of which the overall drug in the body corresponds over the sorry over the overall concentration of drug in the plasma. Okay? So it tells us a dose, the ratio of the overall dose you have to give, right? And the proportion of that drug, right, in the plasma. Okay? So let's say the dose or the total amount of drug in the body um, is like, I don't know, 15 milligrams. Okay. Whatever I do with a volume of distribution calculation, it will give me, let's say, five milligrams in the plasma, okay, according to this particular drug's volume of distribution. So let's have a example, okay? Volume of distribution of morphine is five liters per kilogram body weight, okay? That's a value for morphine. You don't need to memorize this example, right? Let's say I have a patient. He's suffering a lot of pain from abdominal pain. He's a 70 kilogram male, okay? I want three over 70 milligrams per liter of morphine in his plasma to have the therapeutic outcome I want, which is drug uh, pain relief, sorry. We rearrange the equation, okay? And we get dose equals volume of distribution, right, which is uh, five liters per kilogram body weight, 
times the plasma concentration, which I want. Okay? We do that, and we times it, which is 3 over 70, right? I get the dose equals 15 over 70 milligrams per kilogram body weight. And this male is 70 kilograms, so it times it by 70, yeah? And that's a 15 milligram dose that I give to it, right? And that will give me, yeah, 3 over 70 milligrams per litre of, of um, drug concentration in his plasma. Does that make sense? So the volume of distribution is the ratio, right, of all the drug and to the drug that will actually end up in the plasma. Cool? Awesome? Yeah? No? Yeah, sure. So, just like, okay, so, oh, I'm sorry. So, here, we see that drugs distribute depending on the affinity for plasma proteins and other proteins that bind, right? So, when I give this person a drug, eventually a certain proportion will be in each um, department, correct? Okay? The volume of distribution is that value that gives us the ratio of the overall drug all in the body, right, to the amount of drug in the plasma. Okay, and plasma is usually how we measure drugs. Sometimes we can't measure everything else. Okay? And so this is just the equation we use, and we just do simple mass, we fill in the blanks, right? We rearrange and we get a value, which is the overall drug in the body, which just equals the dose that you're gonna give them. Make sense? Cool? Awesome. So, metabolism. You've probably heard of these enzymes before. CYP450 enzymes. There's a group of enzymes in the liver and most of the work in terms of metabolism. What your body does to the drug, right? Pharmacokinetic. It changes the drug. Okay? So, we have subgroups like CYP1A2, which metabolizes caffeine. CY2P2E1, which is your alcohol, right? Or ethanol. Okay? And you can see here that there's a common point of drug interaction. Why? Because multiple drugs could use the same subgroup of enzymes and saturate them, right? And cause them. What's up? Yeah. Pardon? Okay. <laughs> cool. It's real quick. I'll just go through it because it makes sense in the nutrition part. Okay? Okay. That's interesting. It's just a group of enzymes. You don't, know, you don't need to remember the specific ones. It's just the ones in the liver. You'll see this phrase again and again and again as we go through all the drugs because a lot of them use these uh, enzymes. Okay? So what can the liver do to change the drug? Okay? It can add a OH group. It can remove parts of the drug. Okay? And it can add a hydrophilic group to the drug. Okay? So why would we want to add a hydrophilic group to the drug? Yeah, but specifically what kind of lipid bio? Yeah, I don't think you've done this yet. So it's talking about the peer out. Very good. Okay, so you have another renal yet. Essentially, I want you to think of this tube. Okay, oh, do you want chocolate? Yeah. Have a, have a chocolate. No? No? Yeah. Okay, you can have it now. All right. So we have this tube, right? And this tube contains, you know, kidneys, and all the stuff we want to get out of it. Okay? On either side of this tube, right, the walls are made of cells, correct? Yeah? The walls are made of cells, and if you have a lipophilic drug, what, what it can do is when it's being excreted, it just jumps back into the body through the walls of the, this tube. Okay? And everything on the other side gets pissed out. Okay? So it's really hard for kidneys to get rid of hydrophobic molecules, so they just get what we call reabsorbed. Okay? And so when we add a hydrophilic group to the drug, it's easily secreted. Okay? Awesome. So let's take aspirin, for example, um, in that picture below us. Okay. And this new slides, they're on your drive, right? Aspirin gets converted, right? And it gets um, undergoes hydrolysis, removes a part, becomes salicylic acid, which is the active form. Okay. So when you take that aspirin, right, nothing's going on. It's an inactive aspirin, right? And it gets activated by our liver enzymes. This is a particular type of drug. It's called a pro-drug, and we'll come across heaps of them, right? Called a pro-drug. It means it's inactive, and then your liver activates it, they activate it, and it works. After that, you can see that you add a, a group with it with a bunch of OH. You make it lipophobic or hydrophilic, meaning it can be excreted really very easily. Make sense? Comfortable? Pro-drug, right? Cool. First pass clearance, okay? Because your liver does a lot of the metabolism, right? What happens is that when you take that aspirin, 
and it goes into your gut and gets absorbed, what happens is that basically all the blood, there's this group, this system of uh, vessels, right, or the portal system, and that takes all the nutrients, all the blood from the gut right to the liver before it hits the systemic circulation. You'll learn about that um, next year. Okay, essentially, anything you eat has to go through the liver because of this blood portal system, this famous portal system, okay? And so, the first class clearance is the amount of drug which is removed by the liver on its passage through the liver, or, uh, through the first, it's off of that, on its first passage through the liver, then to the systemic circulation. Cool? Awesome. Excretion, okay? So your kidneys and your liver do most of it. Okay, how does your liver do it? Well, it secretes what we call bile, right? Bile is what we use to break down fats when we eat it, okay? and it goes straight to our gut from our liver, okay? What can be contained within that bile are just drugs that your liver removes, so you just shit them out by feces, okay? Kidney, piss it out. Pretty self-explanatory, okay? Sometimes you can piss out the unchanged active form, Yep, or the inactive form after it's uh, been done with by the liver, as we've learned. Cool? Awesome. So, clearance, this is just a formula, right? It's a concentration of the drug in the urine, right, in which you pissed out, times the rate, right, volumes per minute or whatnot, right, at which the urine is being produced over the concentration of the drug in the plasma. Okay? So if your drug concentration of plasma is higher, your rate's probably a bit lower. Okay, in proportion, it's all in proportion. Right? Kinetics, we have two types of excretion. We have first order and zero order. First order is the most common, okay? Why? Because it has a half-life. The more drug you have, the faster it leaves, okay? That makes sense, right? The more drug you have, the faster it will leave through the kidney. Okay, that's most drugs. However, we have a zero order kinetics as well, where it's not determined by the amount of drug, but it's constant, like alcohol and ethanol, okay? So, what can happen here is that sometimes drugs need to be metabolized by the liver, but as we've learned, to be more hydrophilic, to be excreted, right? Sometimes these enzymes can become saturated, okay? If they're saturated, right, but for whatever reason, maybe other drugs using it as well, okay? If it's saturated, that means the rate of that enzyme reaction is constant, okay? And so now the excretion is no longer dependent on the concentration of the drug. Why? Because it's got this big ass barrier. And that barrier is that enzyme saturation. So it's a constant, okay? Whenever the enzyme is done with it, right, then it's excreted. And so that is a straight linear line, okay? It doesn't matter for how much concentration of drugs we have. This is about alcohol. Of course, those drugs which follow zero order removal are easier to overdose on, okay? So you have to be extra careful with those. Cool? Lovely. Pharmodynamics. Affinity, the ability of a drug to bind to its target site. Efficacy, the ability of the drug to produce an effect once it's bound to its um, active target site. And potency, the concentration at which the drug produces an effect. So this brings us to these principles. E max is the maximum effect of the drug. And so if you have uh, like 100 receptors and you only needed five of them to, to produce the E max or the maximum effect of the drug, then I would say you have a 95% receptor reserve of spare receptors. You don't need all of them, okay? R and RT is just nomenclature to describe that, okay? So, this is about agonists and antagonists. Who feels up to labeling A, B, C, and D? Yeah? You haven't done it? So, have you done agonists and that? So, you haven't talked about agonists and antagonists? Yeah, so this is basically it. This is, not, this is like it. Cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chuck it randomly. Yeah? Sorry, my bad. Yeah, go ahead. Everyone, shh. Yeah, good. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, you've seen this picture before. Yeah. Oh, really? Inverse agonist, right? Can you tell me what an inverse agonist does and I'll give you a chocolate? Um, so I think A, so all glucose receptors are inverse agonists. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So where's my cube? I love that cube. It's not my cube, I have to give it back. You have a cube, buddy? Yeah? Cheers. Okay. So Good, awesome. 
full agonist, partial agonist, neutral antagonist, inverse agonist. We're going to go through. So agonists, what they do is they produce a positive response. Okay. And EC50 is the concentration of an agonist required to produce 50% of that drug's maximal response. Okay? All right? You guys, say it's some quiet. Yeah? Okay. EC50, concentration of the agonist required to produce 50% of that drug's maximal response. So the lower it is, that means the less drug you need to produce half the response, the more potent it is. The stronger it is. Does that make sense? That's EC50. A full agonist has full efficacy, right? Goes all the way up to 100%. Partial agonist just goes halfway. It's partial, right? Okay? Doesn't produce a full response. And so, a partial agonist can act as a competitive antagonist to full agonist, right? It's kind of a pleb, right? The partial agonist doesn't do its full job, right? But it's in the way. It's in the way of a receptor and it's in the way of a full agonist. Okay? So, they act as a competitive antagonist. Neutral antagonist, it's like a rock. It sits there, does nothing. Okay? Cool? And inverse. Now, what inverse agonists do, right, is it produces a response to the low basal level. Okay? It down regulates the receptor activity and makes it even harder, yeah, for something to make that, cause that response and bring it back up to its full agonist. Okay? Cool. Awesome. Okay, who wants to do this one? Chocolates. Not a jelly. I'm just chucking random them. Right? I'm a bad thing. <laughs> uh, person with the. the... <laughs> right, pass it to you, mate. I'll pass it to anyone you want. Uh, person with the colorful laptop. Was that turquoise or something? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Label it. There, we have non competitive antagonists and competitive antagonists. Which graph corresponds to what? The number chair? Yeah, basically. <laughs> I'm going to throw it right? So, which one's what? Competitive, non competitive? Awesome. Yeah? <laughs> Making the right. <laughs> All right, good. So, good. Non competitive. Do they tend to be reversible or irreversible? Irreversible. Good. All right. Competitive tends to be reversible. Why? Because they're competing for the same site, which means they can fight each other off if you increase the concentration. Right? Does that make sense? Non competitive binds to an allosteric site, which is a site. Guys, shh. I never thought it was one. Right? Non competitive binds to an allosteric site, right? and you don't need to fight through allosteric site, so they're stuck there forever. Okay? Good. So you can see by the graph, competitive, right, pushes the graph this way. Why? Because you can see the bottom part right, is agonist dose. If you increase the agonist dose, you're able to counteract the effects of the antagonist. Right? So push it off. So it just takes a bit more effort to get to that um, efficacy. Right? That's basically it. Here, non competitive. What you get is the receptor is just bound to, it's gone, irreversible, so you get half the MVC. Right? What's up? We appreciate that you've done that. I like to have like a motion on top. Oh, really? Yeah. And a lot of the stuff we haven't really done. Okay, so have you done the antibiotics and stuff? Yeah. But you didn't do pharmacodynamics, pharmacodynamics, and how it all works. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, we're done anyway with it. <laughs> yeah, we're up to uh, amoxicillin and stuff. All right, awesome. Cool. So, amoxicillin, okay? Amoxicillin is a beta lactam, okay? Inhibits transpeptidases, right? What do transpeptidases do? They stop um, poly, uh, glyco. Oh shit, I've got the name. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Peptidoglycans, right? From being formed and it inhibits them irreversibly. Right? This is our first line drug for most of the time. It works better with gram positive bacteria. Okay, why? Because they have more of a cell wall. Okay? Allergies are very common and resistance is incredibly common. Why? Because it's used so much. Okay? It's renally excreted. 
So you've got to watch out for renal impairment, okay? Beta lactams have a beta lactam group, that little ring, right? This is how it works. Cool? Trolvanic acid or trolvanic acid. Acid. acid right? <laughs> <laughs> right? The most common kind of resistance to amoxicillin is beta lactamase. And as you guessed it, it breaks down beta lactams, right? And so trolvanic acid, right, has the same structure as penicillin, so it fits nicely, right? in the beta-lactamase complex and stops the actual penicillin from being broken down. Cephalexin, all right, it inhibits the same thing basically, irreversibly, right? This is a second line drug for those who are sensitive to penicillin, okay, and it's pretty broad spectrum as well. We have a memory box over here, right, because a lot of them are hard to remember, we have heaps of them, right? Um, cephalexin, flexing strong, breaks down cell walls, right? Um, a lot of these mnemonics, you've probably seen them around, they're basically from like generations and generations of Monash. Uh, medical students, a lot of them are kind of shit, um, so don't blame me, but some of them work well, and it works, if it works for you, then awesome, okay? So, ciploflexin, right? Inhibits topoisomerase. What's topoisomerase? Right, it's a group of uh, proteins which help stabilize DNA, right? You've probably heard of DNA gryase, right? It's a subsection of topoisomerase, right? If you don't have those, you have DNA damage. DNA damage, you get an apoptotic pathway, and you get cell death, okay? It's super broad spectrum, and but we don't use it that often because it causes tendon damage, uh, cartilage damage, it's pretty bad, okay? Topoisomerase, pro, cipro, right? It's meant to sound like pro, I think, right? So what's a pro drug? Who wants this? Where's my cue? Yeah, chuck it to someone. Yeah, you choose, you have the power. Do it, be ruthless, come on. <laughs> Yeah, you're the in, you're in the prize job. Yeah. What's the prize job? You cover this. Remember aspirin? Yeah. Awesome. Hey. Cool. Yeah. You said first one. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Right, aspirin, inactive, right? Then it gets activated by your liver. Awesome, that's a pro job. Vancomycin, you probably heard red band syndrome, yeah? Vancomycin, right, inhibits transglycodases, cell wall synthesis, peptidoglycan synthesis inhibits it, okay? It's third line, it means everything's gone to shit and then you use vancomycin, okay? When does it go to shit? When it's a bit severe infection or methicillin, methicillin resistance streptococcus aureus? Really resistant hospital infections, right? And gram positive bacteria is also an indication, of course, because they have more of a cell wall to pop. All right? So, red band syndrome, what is it? It is a hypersensitivity reaction of your immune system where you infuse vancomycin. The memory box here is, I want you to imagine an ambulance. It's red, it has a cross on it, right? The ambulance is red, red band syndrome. The cross, it's positive, right? It looks like a plus, right? Gram positive and ambulance, emergency. You're screwed when you're in emergency. Okay, and when you're screwed, you use it so it's third line. Thank you, Mice. Cool? Awesome. Uh, this is just how it works. All right, uh, my PowerPoints of a lot of these diagrams after the drug, you do not need to memorize the drugs. Okay, after the diagrams, you do need to memorize the drugs. Yeah? Okay, so we are on to a group of drugs which specifically target ribosomes of bacteria. Why? Because they're different from ours. So we have a 50 S subunit and a 30 S subunit. Okay? Yeah? Chloramphenicol, right? Yeah? Chloramphenicol binds to the 50S subunit irreversibly, right? These indications are conjunctivitis, typhoid fever, and it causes gray baby syndrome. Have you heard of this before? Gray baby syndrome. Why? Because they don't have enough liver enzymes to do the job, and they don't have a renal function high enough to excrete the drug normally. All right? Memory box says, chloramphenicol, chlorine, chlorine. I want you to imagine a 50-meter pool, drowning baby. It's gray because it's been dead. It's been dead for ages. Okay? <laughs> it helps, it helps, right? That baby's dead, it's gonna be dead for a long time, so you can't bring it back. It's irreversible binding, right? You can't bring it back. <laughs> the pool is 50 meters, right? It's a 50 meter pool, like one of those racing pools, right? And so it's 50 S sub Alright? Alright, good. Coram Fenicol. Alright? Erythromycin. Okay, so this is a really broad spectrum antibiotic. 
often used when patients are penicillin resistant, uh, um, sorry, sensitive, right? Allergic. Okay, so it's a macrolide. It binds to the 50S subunit, larger unit, right? And it's used for upper, upper respiratory tract infections and um, pneumonia and things like that. Okay, you do not give a pregnant woman erythromycin. Yeah, and as you can see by um, adverse effects, it uses CYP450 um, enzyme group. That means it, a lot of uh, reactions can occur. So you have to be super careful. Memory box says, Erythromycin, Arith erythrocytes means red blood cells. I don't think you guys covered that before. So it's reversible because red blood cells generate, regenerate, sorry. Grow, growth, upper respiratory tract infections, and mice. Mice, as in mice are always pregnant, so it's contraindicated in pregnancy. And mice have huge ass families, right? So it's a big, bigger subunit, okay? I didn't make this up. Awesome. <laughs> What's up? It's just broad spectrum as well, right? And sorry, it's just a bunch of them like uh, ciproflexin as well. And they're very common because um, a lot of time penicillin is your go-to, and these are just all the other broad spectrum ones with limited side effects. And so they're just a like go-to like first lines. Oh, this is second actually because penicillin is first. Right? Cool. <laughs> awesome. Um, if you said that someone has been autosexual, yeah. does it Oh, it depends on the case, right? Some some things you use more than others. Um, like pneumonia and stuff. Uh, you tend to use more as erythromycin. Uh, it depends on the case, right? Because And it also depends on the doctor as well, right? And what they feel like deciding what they're comfortable with as well. Okay, erythromycin, basically, same thing as erythromycin, but it's been um, fiddled with a bit, so it's a bit has a bit of synthetic groups, right? And it just is broader spectrum. Okay, so it's the same thing. Yeah? Cool. Doxycycline, right? 30S subunit, right? So smaller subunit on ribosomes. Yeah? It's a tetracycline, you'll hear a lot about tetracyclines as well later on. Broad spectrum, it's a post-phylaxis phylaxis for malaria, right? So when you're traveling overseas in high risk areas, right? The doctor may prescribe doxycycline, right? Unlikely, but it happens, right? Side effects are these are important side effects, they come up with questions quite a bit. Um, chelates calcium, takes away your calcium, right? You get yellow teeth, bad bone growth, right? And because it takes away your calcium, you do not want to give it to pregnant women or children, right? And this is just a picture of that. Lovely. So, doxycycline, memory box says cycling bicycle. I want you to imagine that you're riding a bike, but you're doing it backwards for 30 kilometers. When you think of doxycycline, reversible binding of 30S subunit of ribosomes. Cyclists have good bones, right? Relates the bones, it chelates calcium, do not give it to pregnant women and children. Comfortable? Cool. Uh, okay, question What is PA2? Did I talk about this? No, I didn't. I'll skip it. Okay, cool. It's just about antagonists, right? Yeah, nice. Oh, 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 oh. You can you have two, buddy. Three, four, five, 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 five. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, come back. All right, cool. So, gentamicin, right? Gentamicin binds to 30S subunit irreversibly. Okay, it has a short half life and it's broad spectrum and used for serious gram negative infections. Okay, there's ototoxicity, means your ears get worse. Okay, Mary Box, you've probably heard this one before, gentlemen. A gentleman, 30-year-old, middle-aged man, right? 30 year subunit. A gentleman never leaves his lady, so it's irreversible. And a gentleman is old, kind of, right? So you get hearing loss. Yeah? Cool? There is, all right, yeah. Just work with it, yeah? Prepare for sip, right? There are four drugs we use to treat TB in combination. Rifampicin is one of them, right? One of the drugs is not allowed in Australia, so we tend to use two, by the way. So, rifampicin binds the RNA polymerase to inhibit it. R starts both to start with R, so it's RNA polymerase inhibitor, right? Rifampicin, fam, family trip to the tropics to get a TB infection to the tropics, right? <laughs> right? Um, you get right patients who have this, right? They kiss out orange and they freak out, okay? And that's an adverse effect. Yeah. Isoninidid, it's one of the combination drugs for TB, right? Inhibits mycolic acid synthesis, right? I hope you've uh, come across in your lectures that uh, mycobacterium, mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis has mycolic acids, 
on top of this outer layer, okay? And if we inhibit this, we screw with their walls and whatnot, and so they are more susceptible to osmotic um, forces, and you're screwed, basically. So eyes are inhibited, eye, isolate, eye, oh, eyes, island, sorry, island, that's tropical island, right, TB. Okay, so this, hopefully you're comfortable with or did that in your ledgers. So who wants to run through this one? It's just potency initially. Is this another skip? I've done this. Yeah? You haven't done this? Potency efficacy. Yeah, you have? Do you want to do it? Oh. Alright, so your friend is bogging you. So what do you think, guys? <laughs> so at one, which drug is the most potent? So what's potency again? Concentration, right? At which the drug is able to produce half of its response. It's full response. The lower the concentration, right? Good. Oh, no. The lower the concentration, the stronger that drug is. So it's not A, but B. Yeah, awesome. Do you want to talk? Oh. <laughs> what's, what's two? Which drug is least potent? D. D. Awesome. All right? And you want to talk? I don't know who said that, so I don't know who gets it. Are you? All right. Sorry. All right. So, what about three? B. B. B? Awesome. And and what's four? B. Efficacy is a horizontal. Wait, no, vertical. Yeah? It's a response, essentially. So it's half, it's a it's a partial agonist essentially. Right? It means it has half the efficacy. Does that make sense? Yeah? Cool, I'm moving on. Awesome, cheers. All right, metroninazole. Okay, metroninazole interferes with DNA only once it's activated by anaerobic bacteria. Guys, can we write down? Right, only once it's activated by anaerobic bacteria. That means that the indication, of course, is that you need anaerobic bacteria usually there. Right, common point of question is alcohol interaction. Right, People get prescribed this for some kind of infection and then they go have a drink and they feel uncomfortable. They get a metallic taste in their mouth. They feel nauseous. Right? They get a bit of a dry mouth. Metroninazole in the memory box says metro, train tracks. I want you to think of train tracks, unwound train tracks, right? It's basically screwed up DNA. His DNA is unwound. It looks like two straight lines. Right? Metal tracks, right? Metallic taste. You can't drink on the trains, so it's alcohol interaction and trains don't breathe, so it's anaerobic. Or azole, sounds like asshole, right? A hole, and you don't breathe out of your asshole. Yeah? Cool? Comfortable? Okay. Antivirals. Acilovir. Acilovir is a guanine analog. Well, the guanine analog is, is it pretends to be guanine, essentially, gets incorporated into DNA during viral replication and gets stuck. And it jams the elongation so they can't replicate. Okay? Acilovir is for the herpes simplex family. Okay? Cool? Uh, memory box, uh, Silovia, Clover, Green, Guiding. <laughs> Starts with G, I think. Amantadine, right? So, let's talk about influenza and how it works. Influenza gets into your cell, okay? It has channels called M2 ion channels. These ion channels allow for H plus to enter the virus. Once H plus enters the virus, it triggers uncoating. Right? And then that DNA can integrate with the host genome. If we stop the N2 receptors, I'm um, sorry, channels, we stop H plus coming in and uncoating. Amantadine blocks the N2 ion channels. Okay? Use this for your influenza virus A and B. Uh, memory box, Amanda, Amantadine. Amanda is cold, so she does not want to take off her coat. Right? Uncoating, inhibiting, uncoating. Right? You shake when you're cold, you have a tremor, Parkinson's. Yeah? You have tremors. So it's also used to treat Parkinson's in that case. Okay? Or Amanda has Parkinson's. So <laughs> Ocetamivir is a neuraminidase inhibitor. Right? You probably come across this a lot. Right? It's used for influenza uh, A and B. It stops the detachment of the virus from the cell. 
Which drug is used for prophylaxis? Prophylaxis. Right, who has the cube? Can I give it to someone? Yeah, awesome. Okay, awesome. Hey, interferon alpha. Interferon alpha is among your cytokines that you have in your immune system. Okay? And what we do here is we use it for HEP, B, and C, and we basically tell the immune system to come here and deal with this, okay? So interferon alpha, memory box says interferon alpha, A, B, C. Interferon alpha interferes with HEP, B, and C. You don't use this contraindications in autoimmune diseases, why? Right? Because your immune system's already going ham. You don't want to go more ham, yeah? Ritonavir, okay? Now we're up to the HIV drugs, okay? And we often use them in combination. Why do we use the HIV drugs in combination? To avoid resistance, right? Because it's nasty. So, ritonavir inhibits viral proteases, right? What happens in HIV? Gets into your system, right? Reverse transcriptase gets into your DNA. Transcription translation, you get viral proteins. These viral proteins will eventually form the new HIV, but they need to be activated by these viral proteases, and you guess that proteases cleave protein. Okay, and if they're not activated by these viral proteases, you do not get the formation of these new HIV viruses, and therefore you have stopped the replication. Protonavir inhibits viral proteases. Okay, Mary Box Dorito, right? Dorito, uh, no protein in Doritos, mostly carbs, I think. So it's a protease. I'm no, sorry, that's horrible. All right, zero <laughs> budine, zero budine. Okay, inhibits reverse transcriptase. Of course, this is the bane of HIV, reverse transcriptase, right? Changes RNA to DNA, then gets integrated in. It stops the vertical transmission of HIV, mother to child, right? This is what we use to stop the vertical transmission. Zit means kid equals baby equals vertical transmission. Right. Okay, question. Stephen is a 40 year old woman who was diagnosed with bacterial vaginosis and was provided an antibiotic. Later that week, she was at a wedding where she began to taste a metallic taste after a drink or two of wine. What was that drink? I'm just gonna go. It was close. I saw someone like this. Yeah, just. Yeah? What's up? Give us a try. What's the answer? Metro check set. Close? Similar. You said C? Oh, okay. Yeah, C. Did you? Did you remember me? You said C. Okay. Alright. What what is the order? Oh, no, I think it's the next question. Yeah, what's the mechanism of this drug? The one that we just talked about. Yeah, all right, so I well, this area I haven't talked much. All right, you want it? Oh, oh yeah, then you dodge it, mate. Oh, what's up? What's A? What, what's the answer? So I can hear you. It's from Metro Gears. See, all right, awesome. Well, friend. Yeah. Okay. Antifungals, okay? Conazole, right? Can you all hear me? I can't tell it. <laughs> Should we turn it down a little? <laughs> I can't tell from up here, sorry guys. <laughs> I apologize for that. Okay, so <laughs> fluconazole. Okay, so <laughs> inhibits 1 4 alpha demethylase. Is that better? Yeah, 1 4 alpha demethylase. <laughs> right? Stops reduction of ergesterol. What's ergesterol? Basically, does the same thing that cholesterol does in our membrane. Okay? The same thing that cholesterol does, stabilizes it, okay? So if you stop the production, well, then you're screwed, right? So it doesn't work, and it's more susceptible. Same deal, osmotic balance and whatnot. Okay, fluconazole, all 
a gesture roll, right? This is a really good for thrush, right? And fungal meningitis, right? Because it penetrates the blood brain barrier a lot easier, okay? And the second line for invasive aspergillus. That was a Okay, amphotericin. Amphotericin actually binds to ergesterol instead of stopping the synthesis of it, okay? It's irreversible, okay? And basically, it just tears it apart and forms a pore in the membrane, okay? Indication, systemic infections when you're screwed because it's quite homicidal, right? And aspergillus, right? Um, what is aspergillus? Have you come across that before in your micro? Yeah? I think it's a picture here. This is a uh, cystic fibrosis patient. Um, with a lung transplant, basically aspergillus is a fungal and it makes holes in your lungs, okay? And it's nasty. Okay, and we use amphotericin, first line for it, okay? Amphotericin, tear, tear, tear open the fungal membrane of a fungal, uh, tear over the membrane of a fungal cell, forms pores. Nystatin is basically the version, the tropical, tropical version of it. Right, so you just put it under. It's a cream, right? And so you use it for oral thrush, skin, diaper rashes, and whatnot. Cool. What drugs are used against influenza A and B? I know more than one answer. Where's where my ball? Where's my cube? I mean, where's my cube at? Um, who wants it? Yeah, it's Andy. <laughs> Tell me what each of them do. Like, if you just stop. Stop all that, right? What are you afraid to do? Yeah, yeah. What about. Can you imagine something else? But was that two or something? All right, what, can someone tell me how us the time of year works? Yeah, what's up? What's it for? Okay. Antiparasitic drugs, ivermectin. Now, ivermectin, right, increases the membrane permeability, oh, sorry, permeability, yep, yeah, of chloride ions, leading to hyperpolarization. We have hyperpolarization, Right, so you're not going to have any kind of uh, action potentials at work, so it's uh, neuromuscular paralysis. Worm equals worm equals antiparasitic. I got for time. Okay, cancer treatment drugs. Five. I'm going to go quick on now. Five fluorouracil. Okay, it is a pyrimidine antagonist. Why? Because uracil ends the drug, right? And uracil is a pyrimidine. It's an antagonist. Pyrimidine gets misincorporated <coughs> into um, DNA and it's S phase specific. Why is it S phase specific? Because it's during replication that you screw um, with the DNA. So this is for anti cancer. Methotrexate. Now you hear about this drug again and again and again until you double dose it. All right. So methotrexate inhibit, inhibits dihydrofolate reductase. Right. Why? What's that important for? Well, it's important for the synthesis of DNA from folate. Okay. And so you're basically killing cells during S phase. Why? Because that's when they make their DNA. Yeah. We use this for rheumatoid arthritis as well as cancers. Okay. You do not give a pregnant woman methotrexate. Okay. Memory box says you don't give a pregnant woman meth, so you won't give them methotrexate. Eight ends uh, with folate as well, so they both end with eight. So folate and pathway, <laughs> making DNA. Cyclophosphamide is a basically causes guanine bases to cross link. Okay. And so they bind with each other. Okay, and then nothing really happens when you try to have any kind of replication or any kind of transcription or whatnot. And so it just breaks and then it causes apoptosis. Doxy uh, Rubicin is a cytotoxic antibiotic, does a bunch of stuff, okay? It stops protein synthesis, synthesis sorry, binds to topo isomerase, and it produces this reactive oxygen species to screw with DNA as well and cause an apoptotic response. Tamoxifen, now this is a common one, it's probably your PBL, right? We talked about uh, tamoxifen. It is a CERM. Right? Selective estrogen receptor modulator. Right? It's not as simple as a estrogen like agonist, right? What it does is it's an agonist in some areas and an antagonist in other areas. Okay? 
So what we can get is that we can get things like uh, issues with our bones and whatnot, right? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so it's an antagonist for estrogen. Why? Because a lot of these breast cancers are estrogen dependent breast cancers, which means they're fueled by estrogen. So if we can block it at the breast, then we're good to go, right? But if you block it in the bone, estrogen is very important for bones, right? That's why postmenopausal women uh, have high rates of osteoporosis, okay? And so if you block it at the bone, it's always screwed. So this actually promotes it at the bone, right? And blocks it at the breast tissue. So it's selective, right? So it's a CERM as a group of these. Cool? Symptoms aligned with menopause symptoms because you're losing estrogen. Okay. Oh, this is just to show you. Okay. Who wants to do this? There are three answers. Who, who has a cube? Right, chuck it to someone. Right there. All right. Awesome. Where is it at? Okay. Where's the cube? Yep, what's up? B, yes, what else? C, yes, what else? C, that was like team effort, fun. Oh, sorry, that was bad. That was really bad. Just buzz it back. Yeah. Yep, okay. Bonus, which ones are irreversible? Someone put their hand up. Yeah? Which one is irreversible? Oh, reversible, my bad. Yeah, the, oh, not quite? So, reversible, my bad. Which one's a reversible? You guys, yeah? Alright. Oh, oh, wait, no, we're getting like diabetes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Yes. All right. Erythromycin, erythrocytes. Remember, red blood cells regenerate, so it is reversible. Chlorithromycin, same shit as erythromycin. Chloramphenicol, that baby is dead. It is not coming back. All right. So it's irreversible. <laughs> Anesterol. Oh, we're pushing the time. All right. Um, this is for breast cancer as well. Essentially, what it is is um, in postmenopausal women. They lose a lot of their estrogen and they get most of it now from um, aromatase. Okay? And so if you're able to in inhibit aromatase, then you get rid of estrogen. And so those estrogen that pay the breast cancers are good to go. Right? Transmutamab is a monoclonal antibody. Right? HER2 is a receptor normally on cells which promotes growth. Right? Some breast cancers have an overproduction of these receptors or over um, expression of these receptors. So they grow like crazy and become cancerous, right? And so if we are able to inhibit HER2, then it works well for these particular breast cancers. That's what we use transutamab for. MAP, monoclonal antibody. Uh, 2 2 girls, HER2 receptor inhibitor. All right, we're nearly done. So have you come across these before? Basically, when your parasympathetic system is going cray cray, right? So we have this thing called organophosphate poison, and that's like in uh, we spray into buildings, like pesticides and stuff. Yeah, pesticides. Yeah, pesticides and stuff. Right. And what it is is it is an anti-cholinesterase. What's an anti-cholinesterase? It stops the breakdown of acetylcholine. So you have a shit ton of acetylcholine. Acetylcholine goes ham on your parasympathetic nervous system. And it goes ham on the muscarinic receptors and the nicotinic receptors and causes these symptoms. Right? Sludge and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday. Right? 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 Does that make sense? Are you guys giving me these R's? Like, have you come across it before? And... Yeah, so. Pridiostigmine. We use this to treat these vanilla dungas. Right? Pridiostigmine. We use it to treat myostatic blast. MG. Right? Why? What happens in MG? It's autoimmune disease which blocks off your receptors for acetylcholine. You get paralysis, you get drooping eyelids and whatnot. Okay? So if we are able to stop the breakdown of acetylcholine by using an anti cholinesterase, we increase the amount of acetylcholine. Okay? And that offsets the lack of functional receptors. Does that make sense? So you're giving them the ability to use acetylcholine because you're giving them more acetylcholine. Okay? When we give people more acetylcholine, you get sludge, right, on the muscular receptors, and you get these side effects. 
Cool? This was on the episode of House, right? Um, memory box says stick, stick like Top Gear. Do you guys remember that? Yeah? Top Gear, fast, fast muscle movements, anti choline esterase. Yeah. Atropine. Now, atropine is a muscarinic receptor antagonist. It's reversible. Okay? It counters, acts the effect, right? On of pyostigmine, the side effects of pyostigmine. So we use this with pyostigmine as treat, treat MD. Why? Because we get a bunch of sludge stuff, and if we can inhibit, right, the muscarinic receptors, right, we don't get this issue. We just get the muscle contractions that we want. We don't get the side effects from the parasympathetic nervous system. <coughs> right? Cool. Awesome. I saw some nods when I'm on. Atropine is also used for um, glucoma. Right? Pine tree has no sap. I'm not sure if it does. Sap. Slide. I don't get that actually. We'll move on. But <laughs> we're basically done. Nearly done. Uh, patient with a 65 year old woman. Uh, whatever. Read it yourself. Who's got the cube? You got the cube? Where's the cube? Someone drop it. Where's the cube? 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 Where's so this 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 lady has estrogen dependent breast cancer. Estrogen dependent, but she's old though. She's post menopause. That's the idea. Oh, I'm getting bad news. Right, because postmenopausal, you don't get estrogen normally, it comes from aromatase. Rocken, no, rockeonium. Rockeonium stops nicotinic receptors. It, it sits there like a rock, it's an antagonist. Okay, so it's rock, it sits there like a rock. Okay, sucks a methanonium, right? This is what we give patients when we intubate them, when they're like not breathing properly and they have um, airway obstructions. Okay, what this does is it goes ham on the nicotinic receptors, it is an agonist, despite causing paralysis. Why? Because you go super, super ham, it causes what we call M neuromuscular junction blockade. Okay. You go in so ham that they don't even know what to do anymore, so they can't give normal depolarization. Uh, okay, and so it's paralysis, which is true of fluconazole. Am I still shouting? <laughs> so sad. All right, which is true of fluconazole? Who wants it? Where's the cube? Yeah, just give it some. Like, yeah. Awesome. What is true of fluconazole? More than one answer. How we got time? Right here. Right? Yeah, we like the third last slide. Not quite. All right, T, also. What's another answer? Why? I don't know what you said, but I'm looking to it. All right. Fungal meningitis is like crosses the blood name barrier. All right? Second line. What's first line? Yep, awesome. All right, and D inhibits one alpha D methylase, important for progesterone. Mm -hmm. Which this is the last question of the day. All right, I know it's been a long day for you guys. So, which one will overcome this effect? What's rockeronium? What does rockeronium do? Rockeronium. Since they're like a rock, I love it. All right, awesome. Just, yeah, you know what? End of the day, some left over. All right. So, if it sits there like a rock. It's irreversible rock though. Which of the following? Okay, what kind of receptors does it sit in? Nicotinic, lovely. Okay, so what are we going to do? There are there are there are a lot of answers actually. Which of the which of the following? Sorry, so let's just list off the answers. What do we have? Who wants to do it? Does anyone want chocolate? Yeah. I don't know where chocolate. You take it. There are three. There are three answers that you give me to One of them is right. 
What's the last one? It's B. Right, you said B? What about A? Okay, I love it. You said that. You? Okay, A and nearistic mean and heuristic mean are like the same shit. Okay, just like little cousin. Okay? So they do Y, A, T, cola, S rays means there's more acetylcholine, more acetylcholine to fight for that receptor, fight against this drug because it's reversible. Okay? And then you're going to be good to go. Cool. And we are done. <laughs> Sorry about the shouting, bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really? I couldn't tell. <laughs>